Hello there, and welcome back to the booth here at the World Championships on Marshall Cyclift with Matej Zadelkai. It's all come down to this in the Swiss rounds. We've got one more round to go before we solidify our top four. Let's head down to the feature match area. Hello and welcome to coverage of the match, the Gathering World Championship. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Matej Zatalkai, and we are in our last round of Swiss. It has come to round 14, and this round is going to dictate who makes it into our top four and who doesn't. In our main feature match, we have an interesting scenario here. We've got Marcio Carvalho, who is in our top four. He has secured that spot. He took a draw last turn, and even with a loss here, he would still make it in to the top four. His opponent on the other side not in that luxurious position of already having locked up a top four here, Matei. It's Oliver, too, from the United States, and uh, he's sitting on eight and four and one. What's at stake here? Well, if Oliver wins, he's going to make the top four for sure. That's that's guaranteed, no matter what. If Oliver wins, he's in alongside Marcio and BBD. If he loses, then he opens up the slot for someone at nine wins and five losses to make it in. And uh, we thought it would be the winner of the Shota Yasuoka against the Manfield match. But mm -hmm. now that we found out that Brian Brown doing is actually playing against Lucas Blahon, that creates a lot more scenarios for us. Indeed, and we do have those two gentlemen in our feature match area as well. We'll be keeping you updated as to the other matches as we get underway here on our main match. A thought sees from from Carvalho is going to take away a search from t search for tomorrow from Oliver too. Oliver is playing Titan Shift. Marcio is on Obzon, a more traditional build of Obzon. Can you walk us through what each deck is trying to do and how the matchup is likely to play out? Right, so Marcio's game plan, which he's looking to accomplish quite well for now, is play some early discard spells mm -hmm. and then follow up with a, a good creature like a Tarmogoyf uh, or something similar, okay. uh, just to keep up the pressure and try to kill Oliver before Oliver executes his plan, which is to get to seven six lands and a primeval titan or seven lands and a scape shift which usually are game over because of the interaction with valakut and mountains dealing lots of damage at once yeah it has a it feels like a combo finish at the end when oliver two gets to do what he's trying to do and let's see it's an explorer that is going to be taken away here by marcio carvalho and you know you can see that things are moving forward really according to plan here collective brutality coming in here. yeah marcio had a really good draw he Open up with the thought seize on the play as well as a collective brutality, which meant that Oliver really couldn't develop his mana before Marcio started disc uh, discarding those uh, ram spells. Oliver is left with some pretty poor cards uh, in his hand overall. Anger of the Gods is not great in this matchup. And uh, yeah, well, let's see what Oliver drew for this turn though. Two cards, right? Yeah, well, but uh, look at that, Oliver drew a secure tribelder, but Marcio now, if he has a uh, Liliana of the Veil, vale, he could be in grave shape. But I'm, I'm reading, I think it's going to be a Liliana of the Veil vale here for Marcio Carvalho there. That's correct, that. he immediately pluses it, no, no nonsense there for Marcio. That means that both players will be discarding a card, and it's going to be that Anger of the Gods first off the top. For Oliver, he didn't want that in his hand anyway. He finds a Valak at the Molten Pinnacle off the top of his library. But you notice that he did not sacrifice the Secure Tribe Elder. He wants to use it to keep Liliana of the Veil vale in check. Yeah. Playing relatively few creatures like Oliver does means that Liliana can often just go tick, 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 boom, and blow up half your permanence. And uh, Oliver needs to make sure that he has some way to keep that in check at least for a couple of turns. Yeah, it uh, does present a little risk if Oliver uh, if he's not sacking the Secure Tribe Elder and he, he's going to draw a spell that he would want to cast, maybe like a Primeval Titan, which he's a little short of because Mars is just plus in the Liliana. I love keeping the Secure Tribe Elder around just for the exact reasons you said. It keeps the Liliana in check. And look at that, Marcio has no pressure just yet. He just no. has no Tarmogoyf, no Siege Rhinos or anything like that. Or uh, he also ha could have drawn a Scavenging Goose or something yeah, similar. He finds a Shambling Vent, which could present pressure or at least a blocker at some point, but he actually needs another source of white mana to make that work. Here is 
an explorer from Oliver too, though it doesn't actually find a land. He does find another copy of Secure Tribe Elder, and all of a sudden, Oliver's really pressuring Liliana here. Mm. But now Ooh. comes the point where sacking those Sakura Tribe Elders could be interesting because he's up to four mana. Sacking two Tribe Elders means two mountains would enter the battlefield. Uh, that would mean that uh, Oliver would be really yeah. close to starting to pull the trigger on... Uh, on those Valakids. Yeah, look it, at that. It, interestingly, Marcio makes him sacrifice both of them by yeah. minusing Liliana, and you know that means that Oliver says, well, I'll just sack both. But I can tell you that Marcio Carvalho, the reason why he's not plus in Liliana here is he drew Tassiger, the Golden Fang, for the turn. So all of a sudden, pressure acquired here yep. for Marcio. Yeah, it's, it's a good one at that. But we know that Oliver has a lot of life draws now with being at six lands, uh, one of them being a Valakid. He's... Uh, he can deal some damage, especially if he draws something like Primeval Titan, Summoner's Pack. Oh, there's a lot of good draws for him. Here. Can't there's do much with escape shit just ones. yet. Okay. Yeah, he finds another explorer to help him find more, and that was the search for tomorrow. So he's going to continue to just build out his mana base here. And you can see Marcio's already starting to do math at 17 life. He's in a precarious position if Oliver does find one of those huge game-ending spells that he does have multiple copies of in his deck, especially thanks to cards like Summoner's Pack that you mentioned a minute yep. ago, Mate. So Liliana hits the bin after Oliver shoots it for three. So let's see what Marcio can do here. He only has a Path to Exile uh, in hand and draw, draw something else. Oh, that's one of the stinkers. Uh, you really want Colony Heart Expedition on turn two, but really uh, not much sooner. Look at that. Yeah. Tassiger activation, and Oliver now has to either put Lingering Souls or uh, Liliana of the Veil into Marcio's hand. God, I suppose you just give him the Liliana. It depends on if it changes the clock, I suppose. But, you know, with Oliver top decking, he's going to play effectively anything that he draws at any point forward. So it is really just a question of how many turns he's going to have before he's either dead to attacks from Lingering Souls plus Tassiger or before Liliana mm. can ultimate. And yep. he's going to do the math right now to decide which one of those is sooner. Interesting byproduct if he does give him Liliana is that if Marcio does want to start plussing Liliana every turn, well, he might lose a card himself. Yeah, but it doesn't really care. His yeah. hand is thoughts, he's passed, so he's on. Oliver ah. 2 is already hell bent. He's just simply playing off the top of his library because he doesn't have any cards left after the flurry of discard spell and Liliana activations in the early turns here. Speaking of flurries, by the way, we've already got two different results coming in. Shoti Asaoka has won game one versus Seth Manfield in what could be a critical match here for the top four. Luis Scott Vargas has also won his game one over Steve Rubin, though the assumption at this point is that Luis is not able to make top four even with a win here due to his uh, relatively poor tiebreakers. Yeah, I think the best Luis can do is uh, win into fifth place, uh, no matter what the other outcomes are. Unless a miracle happens, but he's yeah, yeah. He, he's just so many percentage points you, behind you, the you, other players. Yeah, you're talking about something weird happening, extreme yeah. edge cases. So for the most part, Luis playing for position there. But uh, Shoti Asoka and Seth Manfield very much relevant. Both players sitting at eight and five, and they need Oliver to lose. Is that correct? Correct. I'm sure, I'm sure they like Oliver. <laughs> uh, they'll be actively rooting against him this round. Yeah, so look at that. Uh, so Oliver gave him the Liliana of the Veil in the end, and okay. it puts the Lingering Souls in the graveyard, which mm -hmm. is kind of easier to cast. Mm -hmm. Can I get some spirits? And there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Carvalho does, in fact, flash that back. Now, this was an important update that we, we just got fed, Marshall. What, what do we have here? So we've got Lucas Blohan up a game over Brian Brown Dewan in what we thought was likely going to be a draw scenario for those players, but ended up being that the two players are playing here. Yep. And Bohan has picked up game one relatively quickly. He's also playing a scapeshift-based deck, and uh, that deck can win very quickly. Indeed. And uh, look at that. Oliver drew a Valakut, put a counter on his uh, Colony Heart Expedition. But Marcio has a, a two-turn clock here. But if Oliver draws Primeval Titan, the game is over. If Oliver draws scapeshift, the game is over. Same goes for Summer Pack because it can find the Primeval Titan. And win the game on the spot. Because, yeah, because playing the Primeval Titan would mean that he gets two lands, two mountains, gets to deal six damage, uh, gets to, or even more, and then sacrifices the Colony Heart Expedition, gets to do it again. So it's uh, just a, a lot a lot of damage at once. Certainly enough to kill Marcio from 14. Yeah, potentially a fetch land could be enough because the fetch land would deal six, and then Colony Heart Expedition it would do 12 more. 
Now, so interestingly, yeah, Marcio's back up to 16 here. Yeah, I don't think that's this relevant, This is a big though. draw step for Oliver, too. Let's see what he finds. You can see how important it is. He needs to find some way it's to get that Colney Heart expedition cracked and get multiple lands on the battlefield, and I think he found a lightning bolt. Yep, it's just the lightning which bolt. Which will not get the job done here for Oliver, too. He really needed that to be a Titan or a Pact, or like you said, maybe a fetch land could get the job done. But as it stands, that's a lethal attack, and that's going to be game one going to Marcio Carvalho, who, again, is already in our top four, looking to bolster his position here. Another thing to keep in mind here is that there's a pro point on the line for every single match. We yeah. will be back right after these messages. Booster Draft Leagues are coming soon to Magic Online. Draft and play at your own pace on your own schedule. Download Magic Online at mtgo.com and join a league starting this Wednesday, September 7th. You're invited to play with the new cards from Kaladesh early. Pre-release events are happening near you on September 24th and 25th. Contact your favorite game store and secure your spot today. And welcome back to the feature match area here in Seattle, Washington. We're at the historic Paramount Theater here in downtown. We are right next to the convention center where PAX is happening as well. And we are going to go see Luis Scott Vargas versus Steve Rubin. Check in on this match here where we've got Luis up a game. Now, Steve Rubin is out of contention for the top four. He's at 7-5-1. and one. Luis has a better record. He's at 8-5. and five, But he also looks to be out of contention, not based on record, but based on his current tiebreaker situation where, you know, he's sitting at 49% at, at tiebreakers, but the other two people uh, in his uh, same category are at 55 and 59, and it's just going to be too tough to make up that much ground. Yeah, if you've ever tried to work out tiebreaker math, 6% uh, advantage is a huge one. I've seen gaps close on 3 or 4%, but 6 uh, it's just very hard to do mathematically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so early stages here, a pair of Noble Hierarchs, one for each player. As it sits, you know, uh, Luis Scott Vargas is playing a traditional Obzon build that he tuned for his predicted metagame here in the World Championship. On the other side of the table, uh, a, a relative newcomer to modern, it's the Bant Eldrazi deck. This is the, uh, the Eldrazi deck of choice after we had the Pro Tour with so many Eldrazi decks uh, floating around. Now we've got Bant Eldrazi has risen as the, uh, the de facto Eldrazi deck here yeah. in There's modern. There's quite a few reasons for that. Uh, green, green gives you access to Noble Hierarch and Ancient Stirrings, which are fantastic mm -hmm. in the early turns, really helping you find what you need. And for this deck, it's Eldrazi Temple or some good Eldrazi. Uh, then you have those displacers, as as Steve just played one, while also having those colorless ones in the top down here in Reality Smasher. But the real uh, curve topper, Drowner of Hope, and Noble Harrier just ties it all together, and gives you all the color of man you need alongside those colorless sources. Yeah. Speaking of relative newcomers, there's a grim flare on the battlefield here for Luis Scott Vargas. This is. Uh, really crept into a lot of these green-black based decks, the Jund and the, the Obzon decks, uh, as, a, as a premium two-drop, oftentimes replacing very powerful stalwart cards like Dark Confidant. Indeed, yeah. I'm surprised how successful Grim Flare actually proved to be in mm -hmm. Modern. I am too. I asked a few of the players about it. You know, how much better is it? How good is it? Is this, you know, kind of a, as Luis would say, the flare of the month, you know, <laughs> type uh, situation? And they said, no, it's legit. Like, when you get to mill away three cards, give yourself delirium, fuel your graveyard with things like lingering souls, uh, and also dig, and this is one of the key things, is post-board games. It lets you churn through your library looking for those really important sideboard cards that yep. these type of decks rely on, you know, cards like Stony Silence and, and that kind of thing, depending on the matchup. And uh, you can really churn through your library pretty quickly. Yeah, and white already being a better uh, color for those powerful sideboard cards compared to red, which is the other color that black green is usually associated with here. As we see green, uh, three, three green flare attacking into the matter shape of the creatures trade. Luis still wants to resolve that trigger of the green flares th thanks to his trample, but look at that. Eternal witness reeled off of that matter shaper. Ugh. It's a one-off 
And look, oh. at, look at that little drug display. So that's a combo. That is a savage combo. And even that's before all of this value that Steve Rubin's about to get right now as he could get back the Mattery Shaper if he won. He went for the Ancient Stirrings instead. But you can't envy being in Luis's seat there and watching your opponent just go off with value there. Yeah, the problem for Luis that I, I'm sure he wants to use this turn to develop his board further. But now he will be forced to answer the displacer witness combo before it gets out of hand too quickly because Steve got a bag of ancient stirrings yes. with that and he can find maybe an Eldrazi yes. temple and really start yeah. like so blinking this, away his eternal witness. This is the Grim Flare trigger after all. Like you said, it got plus one, plus one thanks to Exalted and so that means it did hit Steve for one point of damage. Only two toughness on the matter reshaper means that Luis gets to look at the top three cards of his library and he put two of them back and I can tell you, Matei, that one of them was Damnation and That's the other one was card. a Tarmogoyf. So a pretty nice little one-two punch there. Yeah. Look at, yeah. Uh, Luis did get rid of the displacer the there with the, with, uh, with the Maelstrom Pulse. Not a great use of his turn, though, taking up all, all three of his uh, lands there. So there we go. So Ancient Steering's with more good stuff. Look, Steve's hand is stacked. He has uh, he has a reality smasher in his hand, and another displacer. Hmm. Yeah, Luis goes down to eleven from that eternal witness attack, and yes, yeah. another displacer. And Steve is already lining up a, a hog smash for next turn. So. Luis Scott Vargas has that damnation and can just fire it off here to wipe the board away, hmm. assuming that he has a black mana source, which he does. Yeah. A little awkward that he's got his own copy of Noble Hierarch here, hmm. uh, you know, but you do what you got to do. I mean, his hand is, uh, his hand is interesting. With that damnation, really uh, being a good card in this matchup, but uh, the question is if he has anything to follow that up with. Cards? He, yeah, so he put a Tarmogoyf on top with the Grim Flayer, so yep. I would assume so. Uh, look at that. Steve is going to path his own creature to guarantee that he hits the fifth land there for uh, the reality smash that he has in his hand. Oh, wow. Uh, that's pretty That's pretty rough for Scott Vargas, who's sitting on eight life. Now, Luis is up a game here, so even if he oh. were to have his reality smashed, as it were, they would get to play a game three. Mm. Damnation <laughs> looks pretty good against Steve Rubin, though. He's got, yeah. you know, creature-based mana in the form of Noble Hierarch, and then the, his whole deck is based on creatures. If you look at his curve, it's just reality smashers, Thought Knot Seers, Drowner of Hopes, and uh, Matter Reshapers so alongside those Eldrazi Displacers. There's a lot to kill there. Yeah, so now Luis has to answer the, the reality smasher while Steve can... Could have some very good follow-ups as well. Yeah, things looking really good for Steve Rubin. We'll hang out here for just a minute to see if he can finish off this game and force the game three before we move back to our main match, who is just finished mulliganing, it looks like. And uh, once we get there, we'll be back underway. Luis thinking through his options here, making sure. <laughs> he does have a thought seize. Yes. Quite risky going down to one here. He doesn't sees see much. A rest in peace, as well as another noble hierarch. Yeah, but with being at one, even that noble hierarch might be a threat. And it's a Tarmogoyf. Okay, so he, taking that the rest in peace is actually very important. He hit an, he hit an enchantment. Creature, enchantment, creature, sorcery, instant land. So that would be a 5 6 Tarmogoyf if yeah. that were the case. But it's actually like. We know Steve has the Noble Hierarch, so he can get make his Reality Smasher 6-6 six, six here. And force a Chump Block. Yeah. Now, with a Path to Exile, does Luis have two cards in his I hand? I think Luis has only one the card. One? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Chump Block only well, for Luis. Maybe this is another Damnation, something like that. <laughs> yeah, he's tapping his mana, not scooping just yet. Sure. He found another <laughs> Tarmogoyf, though, that... I'm sorry, I thought you said go. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> A little awkward turn there. 
mis a small misunderstanding, but I don't think it's going to matter. And uh, I don't think there's a Drowner of Hope. And I yeah, think and that will actually just end the game right on the spot as the Drowner can tap down the Tarmogoyf. Attack. And he does have a path, and Luis, of course, needed that extra card to be able to take down the attacking Reality Smasher, and this is not over just yet. Yeah, so Luis about hanging as close on by a thread. Get. Two lethal threats for Steve Rubin. <laughs> hanging on by the narrowest of margins. Yeah, I mean, Luis out of cards. Epic comeback. Uh, you know, if he does find a removal spell for the Drowner of Hope, you know, it's really actually brutal for him because even if he does, then Steve can just tap down the Tarmogoyf and attack with the Noble Hierarch by itself. <laughs> I don't know how Luis gets out of this without another sweeper or maybe a card like Lingering Souls. I mean, he can draw a removal spell here. Okay, here's a Grim Flare. Okay, uh, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> Because now, uh, I mean, this is you know another scenario where it, it lengthens the game, but yeah. not necessarily puts Luis in a better position to actually get back to even here. Mm. This has been really cool down the stretch, though. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> Luis with the epic comebacks here. Uh, th possible. This would be one of the most epic comebacks in Magic history if he managed to win this one. Okay, so Steve is going to force a chump block here. On the the Tarmogoy specifically chump blocking, but Steve does not have anything else in his hand. What does Luis have? Oh, no. <laughs> He's going to attack, and Ruben says, no, don't do that. So uh, Luis has something in his hand uh, to follow that up. That He must have a path to exile. Yeah, but just any, also any creature for, uh, for a chump yes. action because, yeah. L lingering Souls as well is an option. Also, Luis could be digging for Lingering Souls. Remember, yeah. you can put it into uh -huh. the graveyard. And he does have a Lingering Souls. <laughs> oh, Luis hanging on at one life. <laughs> still in it, and you know, he's setting up. He's still his, very in it. Yeah, he's setting up the top of his library every turn now. Yeah. And Luis can flash back the Lingering Souls. Maybe even two if he finds another. Okay, he kept both cards on top. He's going to flash back Lingering Souls. And he, you're right, he kept two cards on top and one Marsh Flats into the graveyard, one card in hand for Luis, and he's got a lot of chump blockers. <laughs> and Steve just bricked twice. He now. just hit two lands in a row. Is Luis actually going to hang on at one life and come back? Abrupt decay to kill the Noble Hierarch. And there's Liliana Jeez. that he set up, and Luis is now firmly ahead. He's going to try to win this game in two turns. He says, look, if you've got Reality Smasher, then I'll extend the hand. But until then, I'm killing you next turn. You must find something immediately, Steve Rubin. Yeah, I don't quite see the card that he, he's digging there with, but I was pretty sure I saw another Planeswalker. He put them all on top. Smash? Is it a Smasher? I think so. No, S it's thought a Thought Not, not Seer. Go ahead. No right. cards in hand for Scott Vargas, and he's got yeah. Gideon. He can make an emblem, and Luis wins. Look at Steve. He can't believe oh, he lost that unbelievable. game. Unbelievable. He was so far ahead. Luis Scott nice. Vargas putting, up, putting on a show for us in his last game of the World Championship here as he defeats Steve Rubin and puts himself in that absolute best possible position for that tiebreaker, but it's going to be really tough for him to actually get top fours. He needs a miracle, basically. Okay, back to our main match. Marcio Carvalho, who defeated Oliver Two in game number one. He's going to be on the draw. Let's see if Oliver can come up with a little bit of a quicker start. We see no search for tomorrow on turn one from Oliver. No, but his hand is actually looking very spicy Ooh. here. Ooh, uh, there's a Scape shift off the top after playing an explore, and he did have another land. Go ahead. Yeah, but he drew a second scape shift where he already had one. Ah. And the rest of his hand, look at that. Tireless Tracker, Obstant Bailoth. Eh, I mean, it's fine, but he has a little too much action now. He needs the mana searching, the lands themselves. But if Marcio doesn't actually have a lot of discard, this hand is fine because Oliver could play Tireless Tracker, play a land, get a clue. You know, and set himself up for following turn. And Oliver is well protected against Liliana with that obstinate bail off. Yeah, Marcia doesn't look too happy about his options here. He does not, does he? I'm going 17. Yeah. 
takes the full full three there. Fetch land into shock land. And his land looks like a decent. He has the removal spell. He has a Grim Flare and a Tarmogoyf. I don't think he was able to find a configuration of lands that would have allowed him to play a turn one Inquisition and turn to a Grim Flare there or Tarmogoyf. I, I think he's going to go for the Flare here and try to set up for the following turns. Yeah, you know, it does hit quite hard. You know, you get that first activation. Sometimes you can get yourself Delirium and then get a real clock going, especially against Oliver, who tends to not do a ton mm. in the early stages as far as blocking or interacting with creatures. Yep. But you can see that post-sideboard, that isn't necessarily the case. As uh, there Now there's a tireless tracker and a clue from Oliver, too. Uh, it's nice. Yeah, that's that looks pretty good. You know, I, the one-two punch here being right that that Oliver has boarded in creatures where Marcio is is much more likely to board out cards like Abrupt Decay and these yeah. you know cheaper creature kill cards. So a tireless tracker can look pretty good. Yeah, now now it's uh, the removal suite for Marcio. It's actually proving not to be that great in this spot because actually. Uh, using a path to exile to kill tireless track is not that great because Oliver's ultimate plan is just a ramp up to mana so basically serve as a ramp spell for Oliver if Marcia were to use his path to exile. Marcia would have loved to have a Liliana here for example, just Liliana minus attack with the Grim Flare stab your following turns. So yeah, Marcia not in great shape here but he has a lot of haymakers of himself. Tarmogoyf, Gideon, Tassiger, mm -hmm. a lot of power in his hand. A little bit of a non bow there with mm -hmm. Grimflare and Tassiger. You, you get rid of your own Kaiser Graveyard, so you don't have Delirium anymore. But if Grimflare just bends all the cards, you have enough food for uh, for that Tassiger delve. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, getting to the point where you can play Tassiger very early in the game probably offsets that enough to make it worth it. And uh, he really doesn't want to path no. to exile this tireless tracker, but he's like, oh, I guess I just have to. Yeah, <laughs> you see that hesitation. <laughs> not great. He's just basically now hoping that Oliver doesn't have much going on in his hand because what this allows Mars to do is attack with the Grim Flare for two, um, set up his next turn while also adding a Tarmogoyf to the board uh, for the following ones. Yeah. Wow, this is interesting. Oliver had searched out a mountain, but he's actually considering getting a, f a forest instead. Mm. Interesting. Looking at his hand. I would go for mountain here. He already has two forests. He goes for the forest, though. All right. Okay. Oliver down to 18 after that Grim Flare hit. And uh, Mars is going to start loading up the graveyard. He probably wants to draw land eventually, just because he has that Gideon in his hand, too. Mm -hmm. And it's just a lot of pressure. Now, one of the matches that we've been keeping a close eye on that we thought might very well be an intentional draw coming in and wasn't is Brian Brown doing versus Lucas Blahan. They're tied at a game of peace, Matei. Ooh. Yeah, they're going to game three. So we'll, we will continue to keep an eye on that. You can, you got a little quick view of, uh, of BBD back in the feature match area there. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep an eye on and bring you updates on that one. That one has possible top four implications as we Keep an eye on that for you. We can tell you that Marcio Carvalho here on the left-hand side is going to be playing in the top four. Same thing with Brian Brown doing. Yep, they're both locked. But their opponents are not. Lucas Blahan and Oliver Two, who we see here, are uh, very much live and playing for a spot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Black, black, yeah, yeah. If Oliver can peel off two games in a row against Marcio here, he will find himself in the top four. Yeah. Rookie um, of the Year or Constructed Master. Marcio really... Uh, wrapping it up here with uh, with uh, the Tasker exiling his whole graveyard there just to put up a four power creature. He still has a Tarmogov and a Gideon uh, in his hand, and it looks like Oliver bricked on an untapped land here. So what? It, let's see what he drew. He's gonna. It looks like he's going to sack the clue here and hope to draw into land on a search pair. Okay, lands, that's good enough. I think Oliver is going to play the obstinate Bailout from his hand. Okay. And it might, it might have been another reason to search up a forest. If he expected to draw maybe a Sucker Tribe Elder or Explorer, he wanted to be sure that he can cast both obstinate Bailout and something else. Yes. 
Got another exciting uh, update. You know, of the players that came into this round with 24 match points, that was Seth Manfield, Luis Scott Vargas, and Shota Yasuoka. We saw Luis win his match in, uh, with a little bit of flair there a minute ago. Seth versus Shota, they got paired against each other. And Shota Yasuoka, the Hall of Famer, just defeated Seth Manfield two games to zero wow. to put himself at nine and five. Now, he's in contention here. He has the best tiebreakers out yes. of everyone in the tournament. Mm. So he, at 59%, uh, Shota has the best shot to make it uh, if Oliver Two loses this, no matter what. Okay. And currently Oliver's down. Mm. But he does have a 4-4 four -four obstinate Bayloth on his side, and he's at 22 life. And he does have the requisite six lands that you often see from this deck. Now, there's a Calming Heart Expedition, but you can see by the way that Oliver's, you know, moving here, that he's got more than just that going. Mm, yeah, he's, yeah, in yeah. fact, so doing math. It looks like a scape shift lining up. Yeah, I think he's going to go for... Uh, uh, it's interesting. So he has Calling Heart Expedition, and he actually he does not have seven lands to go for the kill with Scape Shoot, that which is Valakut and six mountains. Okay. Each mountain wing worth three damage. He's trying to set it up with that Colony Heart Expedition. Okay. So he's going to uh, search up for some lands, uh, some lands here, get a lot of counters on the Expedition, and then sack the Expedition and get two mountains and uh, deal a lot of ma damage all around. So I think he's going to go for yeah, va double Valakut here. Yeah, so he has two Valakuts, four mountains now. Yes. Doesn't get to do, deal any damage because Valakut needs to see six mountains. But now he's going to sack the expedition, find two mountains, and deal 12 damage. 12 in chunks of three, however he wants. Yeah. And he's just kind of mow down the board <laughs> yeah. here for Marcio Carvalho. <laughs> and wow. blow up the game. What a turn. Boom. And plus, he's setting up for the kill next turn because he has one more escape shift in his hand. Absolutely, and Carvalho has seen enough. He's going to scoop up his permanence here. He's not even going to wait for the other escape shift to hit, and that means that we are going to get a game three. Oliver two versus Marcio Carvalho. Oliver playing for top mm. four, looking to scrap his way in here as our rookie of the year and our constructed master. But uh, he's got one more game to win against Marcio yeah. if he's going to do that. So for those who are just t tuning in, uh, you have to remember that Brian Brown doing and Marcio Carvalho are locked into the top four no matter what happens. But because of how this is playing out, it basically means that I, I think if uh, Lucas Blahon or Oriol 2, if either of them fails to win, then Shota Yasuoka is in the top four. But it requires one of Oliver Two and Lucas Blahon to lose. If Lucas Blahon uh, wins his match against Brian Brown doing, he's in for sure. So is Oliver Two. If he wins, he's in. But if both Lucas Blahon and Oliver Two win, Shota Yasoka is fifth. Looks like we're going to get a chance to uh, see Brian Brown doing and uh, Lucas Blahon. Yeah. Uh, Lucas still has a shot to make it into the top four, even with the loss. If Marcio Carvalho wins, yes, then he is, and uh, he should be in fourth place wow. because Shota Yasoka okay. is going to be third. Okay, well, we are the, with the way the, the eye on it. Yeah. I think Luis is at best fifth, even with that win. But we know two players, Marcio Carvalho, Brian Brown, doing they're they're going to be in the top four for sure. And these two matches will determine who else it's going to be. It might just be that we're going to see these four players tomorrow as well, mm. if Oliver Two and Lucas Blanc both win. Yes. They control their own destinies here. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the final game for the top four, yeah. for either of them. It's really all you can ask for. Yeah. But still, if even right, if Lucas Blanc out. loses out, then it should be still, he should still have a shot if Oliver Two loses. Okay, let's jump over and see Lucas Blanc versus Brian Brown Dewin. I believe that uh, BBD's on a mulligan to six here. And it looks like Lucas Blahan also mulliganed to five, though. And he doesn't have a second land here. Oh, Whoa. no. This could be bad for Lucas Blahan. On the Brian Brown doing is in that en enviable position of not needing to win here, but hey, he'll take one. Oh, yeah. Let's see if he can get on the board. Horror. Sir? Horror. Horror? He's going to yeah, name horror. horror with that Cavern of Souls and play an Eldrazi Sky Spawner, which is going to get remanded now. That won't actually 
remand it, but it will, uh, excuse me, it won't counter it or put it back in his hand because it can't be countered, but he will draw a card. Yeah, he just wanted to draw a card. Mm -hmm. He was only on those uh, on those two lands there. He top decked the Flood Girl, which is actually perfect. And now he also drew a Swamp, and he'll be able to play that Search for Tomorrow, getting up to four mana. Oh, this is getting interesting. Yeah, but... Miss land drop number two, but now he's just cruising. Yeah, Brian does have a Reality Smash in his hand. I think I saw Thought Nods here as well. So for a six-card hand, Brian is pretty good, especially if he manages to uh, play one more land. But even if he doesn't, he should be in an okay shape. Now, one of the reasons that, that's kind of interesting here, you, you know, you might ask, well, why is Brian Brown doing playing against Lucas in this round? They could have taken a draw and just said, hey, let's go get lunch. But, uh, you know, it does have standard implications for tomorrow about who, who do you want to play against? Mm -hmm. What type of matchups do you want? And it could just be the case that Brian does not want to face down Lucas in the standard portion. Uh, that's actually my understanding that mm -hmm. uh, Brian's a banned humans deck in standard just doesn't match up very well against uh, Lucas Blahon's uh, John Delirium deck. You know, it's full of Kozlex returns and languishes and things like that. And just Brian doesn't want to play against those sweepers. That's why they didn't draw, because uh, depending on how the other matches would turn out, it was actually quite likely that Brian would get to play Lucas in the semifinals. Ah. Well, Lucas is fighting for the right to uh, earn that matchup. <laughs> and, of course, that seat in our top four here at the World Championship. Of course, they're also playing for a pro point, which, uh, yep. you know, when you get down to the end of the season, become incredibly valuable. When oh, you're yeah. starting to get close to getting to gold or close to getting to platinum, every single pro point matters. And it's a lot on the line. If you take a draw, nobody gets that pro point. Yeah, look how perfect that was from Brian. He drew, now, not only did he have land, it was an little draw the temple, which meant that he didn't even have to sacrifice uh, the, the spawn for, for the additional mana mm -hmm. now. Uh, Lucas is forced to already tap all creatures and draw a card. And I think With Cryptic Command there. Yeah, Brian might just add more stuff to the board. It's actually quite risky looking at Lucas's hand. Uh, what is Lucas holding? Uh, Damnation. Oh. Which is which can clear the board really well. But I think uh, Brian's just going to run out of the Thought Knots here. And yeah. Just take that take away. It. Jeez, look at this. Oh, but there are... <laughs> this gets kind of interesting because you start to wonder how many copies of these sideboard cards Lucas has available in his deck with two Bring the Lights in hand. Mm. You know, he, he is able to dig these kind of things up. Maybe maybe I can have you take a look at that, Matei, and see yeah, if there's maybe another Damnation no. or is it just the one? There, there just isn't. No, that, just the one main deck Damnation. Okay. No other big sweepers for this matchup. Okay, well, this is interesting. Uh, Brian is going to take away Cryptic Command and kind of dare Lucas to find a land off the top of his library, which he just did. Yeah. Does it make black? I would assume not. No, it does not. It's he a stomping has, ground? It's a stomping ground. Yeah. Yeah. He, can he, he cast <laughs> Damnation? He can. He has one Water Grave and uh, okay. one Swamp in his deck. So he needs to find a fetch land that can find one of those or the card itself, which he did not do this turn. No. BBD kind of banking on that and probably a, a relatively safe line there. He might so have something else. He could easily have something else. Let's see what Lucas Blahan has lined up for us. He's down to nine. He is facing lethal damage Obstant next Baylor. turn, and he needs something to either gain life, sweep the board. No, cryptic command. Cryptic command. Will that do it? He can take <sighs> the Thought Knot Seer. can bounce Five, that. Five, six, seven, eight. That actually would leave him at one if he bounced the Thought Knot Seer. Mm. Just it not feels great. like it's not a line that, that's going to make it, like, it's going to make it very difficult for him to actually, actually win. Mm. Because the thought not gets to once again pick apart his hand, but yeah, so that's what he does. So, draw two cards. Yeah. Yeah. so draw a card. Draw that's it. from the cryptic command, and then of course he also gets one from the thought not seer. Mm. But this is Lucas scraping and hanging on and barely doing so with that. Now with the loss. For Lucas, you said he still has a shot. Yeah, but he but needs he Marcio Carvalho to he win. He needs Marcio Carvalho to win. <laughs> And that is completely out of his hands. So uh, you go to one, right? he's oh, going no, go no, to go to one. It looks like he had gained a life at some point in there. So he's actually at 10 and not one. Oh, excuse me, at two and not one, which 
isn't super relevant here, I don't think. Hmm. Now this is interesting because BBD has to say, well, now you've got escape shift. I can't lose from here, can I? And he, he can't, right? Even he, with six, he, six No, mana. because he's a two life, Lucas, there is a way where something like secure tri builder and escape shift on six man is actually uh, 18 damage, but, but Brian is also 19. Yeah. So while and, Lucas and tr could try to do something, but it's just very unlikely. Yeah, also the stomping ground, you know, coming into play untapped means that Lucas is dead. Yeah. Okay, so he left him with with the scape shift. Uh, Brian's a little uh, scared of yeah. the brink to light, but let's see if Lucas can. This draw is it for Lucas. He only gets one more turn, and he found a land off the top, and that's going to do it. Brian Brown doing defeats Lucas Blohan. Now, again, for fans of Lucas Blohan, that does not necessarily mean the end for him, but there's even more somehow riding on our main table match mm. here: Marcio Cavallo versus Oliver Two. It's all down to this one for not just Oliver, but other players now as well. Yeah, basically what, uh, the result of that match now guarantees that Shuri Asoka is in top four. Okay. Because he has the best tiebreakers out of the people at 27 points. And now we'll get to see if it's going to be Oliver 2 getting in with 9, 4, and 1, or if it's Lucas Blohan squeaking into fourth place. So Lucas really wants Marcia to win. And uh, yeah, for Shoda, he can go home knowing that he's going to be coming back tomorrow. Shoji Asaoka famously had an, one of the most incredible runs in the history of this type of tournament in the very oh, yeah. first iteration of it. Now, he did end up losing to Yu Watanabe in the finals of that, but he was so far ahead of the rest of the field, and in, that was in a field similar to this one, just stacked with some of the best players in the game. Yeah, he was crushing it. I'll tell you what, the other players, you know, the BBDs and the Marcios in the world of the world will not be happy to hear that Shoji Asaoka is going to be in there. He is so good at Indeed. It's very intimidating. Uh, look at that. Wow. So this is a huge turn here for Marcio Carvalho. Comboing out, really, using the Grim Flayer, attacking Oliver 2, stocking up his graveyard, and powering out a Tassiger, the Golden Fang, as well as a Tarmogoyf. And uh, this could be a quick one if Oliver doesn't have the ability mm, this to really make stuff happen. You can see that the next turn for Oliver looks to be pretty explosive. Yeah, I mean, Lu uh, he has double primeval titan in his hand, but he's just lacking a little in lands. He didn't have a fort land to play, but now has search for tomorrow and secure tribal. So he needs to draw a land. Yeah, for for that primeval titan. Yeah, but, but like because a he has a Valakid? he does, ha does have a basic forest. So I don't think the turn he plays primeval titan might not be enough, especially because Mars. Look at how much. Pressure Mar Marcy already has. Yeah, I, you know, the secure tribe elder gets to take one for the team blocking either the Tarmogoyf or the Tassiger, whichever's bigger. Mm. And it looks like that would be the Tassiger at this point because Tarmogoyf looks to only be a 2 3. But all, it all depends on what Marcio will oh, do here. Marcio has a Liliana. Is he going to minus Liliana? Yes. He is. He's clearing the way. He wants to make sure that he kills Oliver next turn and really tries to shut the door on this game as quickly as possible. Mm. And he actually that, might be successful because we know that he has double path to exile in his hand. So Oliver needs to draw a land to uh -huh. play, even play a primeval titan. But Marcio uh, playing this this way, he gets a hit for nine here, plus putting Oliver down to six. Yes. And plus set up his next turn if he really wanted to look at that. He also, there's Surgical Extraction, another Liliana of the Veil in his hand too. He's going to keep the Surgical. Put that back. He's thinking. I mean, he has double Does path. Does it matter? I don't think at this point it it's going to matter. It feels like that won't matter anymore. Mm. Yeah, but Marcio wants to make sure that he doesn't make a critical misstep down the line. Now, if Oliver 2 loses here, what does that mean for Lucas Blahan? If Oliver 2 loses this game, Lucas Blahan gets into the top four in fourth place. Okay, so this is Unless something crazy turn. happens. Unless something crazy happens, we always have to leave that caveat there. As yeah. Sometimes crazy things do happen, and we don't want to lock things in stone. We'll let... Rich Hagen up on the top deck. He will have, you know, the, the, the rock solid info about what's happening. And mm. of course, we'll have our top four announcement just a little bit later today after we get the, the final results in. If there's this one thing is Oliver, too. He did find a land off the top of his library, a windswept heat that will allow him to cast a primeval titan, but is it too late? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I mean, mean, can he stabilize? That's the interesting question because if he can generate some amount of damage, kill a threat or two, and still have the 6 6. Uh, and, you know, reduce Marcio down to not being able to attack for six. He could 
yeah. potentially chain the, Titans together here. Yeah, there's one out for uh, for Oliver here. Instead of going for the Primeval Titan, he could go for Engineered Explosive that he has into in his hand, and he, he has to. He can play... So that would kill two of the three threats. Yes. And that's exactly what he's going to do. That has him dropping down to two life and losing one of the cards in his hand, though he's got an obstinate Bailoth, and we may see Marcio Carvalho just not even activate Liliana for fear of that. Yeah, he shouldn't. He shouldn't. But it's an unintuitive play when you have yeah. such a powerful Planeswalker on the battlefield. Hey, now it, the, the choice with the Grim Flare from the pe previous turn might come back to haunt uh, Marcio. Now he's realizing that he's going to draw, uh, I think, a Surgical Extraction, that he's it's just... Yeah, that, that's exactly what he and did. And it's actually just useless. Oh, this is really getting interesting now. Oliver barely hanging on to life, <laughs> potentially falling to two here. And also another thing that Marcy has to think about, he should not activate the Liliana, because if he does, Oliver gets to put in, uh, an obstinate bailout for free. Okay, Oliver's yeah. down to two. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about, Matei, and, it, and it's, it's tempting. You know, it's kind of the normal line of play is to plus Liliana here, but if he does, he's going to get punished it's very hard guys. for it. Yeah, also, Oliver having that fetch line being at two minutes effectively at one because he will need to crack that one swept heap for, I think, what's going to be a stomping ground. Yeah, he has to. I guess, suppose he could draw an untapped land on his turn or something, but he will eventually have to. If so let's see what happens. Yeah. If, <gasps> it looks like Marcio's going to plus Liliana. Oh, he's hesitating now. This is the key moment. He's going for it. He did. He plussed it, and Oliver 2 is going to slam Opsin and Bailoff on the table, and that's one of the two Path to Exiles hitting the graveyard here for Carvalho. He keeps Surgical Extraction in his hand. Yes. Whoa. Yeah, what but now if Oliver around. draws... Oh, he didn't crack that. And he has an untapped land. He, he can, did. He can just go for the kill here and secure his birth in the top four. Is he going Look at this. It's a escape it. shift for Oliver 2. And he actually wow. wins there. Oliver 2 takes down Mario, Marcio Carvalho and puts himself into the top four. You can see he's as shocked as we were about how the end of that match finished up. <laughs> Oliver. Into the top four. Now, to be fair here, Marcio Carvalho also in the top four as well. So both of them are going to be in. And our top four looks pretty well set here. At Brian Brondu and Shoti Asoka, Marcio Carvalho, and Oliver too. Let me just say something, right? Our top four is going to be the draft master. Yes. The constructed master. Yeah. The GP master. And the master himself. <laughs> Shoto Yasuo. The master master. Yeah. Wow. Oh, man. That really delivered on the excitement down the stretch there. <laughs> Crazy stuff from our feature match. And, of course, that's how the things were going to go down the line here. So we've got Richard Hagen up on the top deck with all of the information from the tournament. Let's send it to him right now. Not so fast, my friends. Not so fast. We're doing some math up here. If I'm Lucas Pohan, I'm not certain, Ian, that I'm absolutely dead in the water. Here's the thing. The difference between them, we, yes, we know that the top three are in. Carvalho is in at nine, four, and one. BBD is in as the number one seed at 10, three, and one. Oliver two is in, nine, four, one. So then it's which of the nine fives make it in. Louis Scott Vargas, nine, five, terrible tie breaks. No way he makes that up. But coming into that last round, Yasuoka was at 59, Blahon was at 56. Yasuoka won, pushes his opponent's match win down. Blahon loses, pushes his opponent match win up. Who finishes fourth? Not sure it's in the bank yet. Yes, Yasuoka is favorite. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be amazing. Down on the floor, though, we have an interview. Here's Brian David Marshall with a very, very happy man. Thanks, Rich Hagan. I'm here with Constructed Master Oliver Two. He went six, one, and one in his two constructed legs of this tournament. Oliver, walk us through that crazy third game there against Marcio Carvalho. Well, he had me under a lot of pressure, and the engineered explosives was the perfect answer to his board because it kills the 
two of the giant creatures he had. Of course, he saw a Tassiger, and I was really worried about collective brutality at the end there, uh, which would have just killed me, but there's nothing I could do about that. He also played very well when he, uh, instead of plus one the Liliana when he first played it, he minus two to put a lot of pressure on me. But thankfully, he didn't have the collective brutality, and everything worked out. So there, there's a very big sweat of a turn there where he's looking at his Liliana, and he's yeah. like, you guys are doing a little dance. How hard are you trying to not betray any kind of emotion that you have the obstinate Baloth in hand? I can't give anything away. I was trying not to like look at my hand too much or make any uh, facial emotions. I mean, I'm good at having a poker face, if, but um, yeah, it was tough. And I was really hoping he'd plus one, but even if he didn't, uh, I had many outs to win the game there. I needed any two mana ramp spell or any lands would do it. All right, so remind us about your standard deck. What are we going to see from you on Sunday? Uh, I'm playing what's called Turbo Emrakul. It's kind of like Team or Emerge, except more focus on ramping and just getting to a quick Emrakul. And you came into the uh, tournament center upstairs and did a deck tech with us on that? Yes. All right, so you can check that out. You want a little preview of what Oliver Chu is going to be playing on Sunday. Check it out. In the meantime, I'm going to let the Constructed Master go celebrate with his friends. But you got to come back here at 5 o'clock. we got to do interviews. I'm just telling you that right now, okay? 5 o'clock today? Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, sending it back up to Rich at the news desk. Housekeeping live here at the home of magic, the Paramount Theatre. Congratulations to Oliver, too. That, Ian, was well, I mean, it was devastating magic, whether you're on Marcio Carvalho's side of the board, Oliver Two's side of the board, or if you're Lucas Bohan watching on. It was such an exciting game. You know, Rich, you and I are up here in the balcony here. We're looking down on the stage, and we were just watching this unfold in person. You know, I'd say on the edge of our seats, but we're standing <laughs> up, right? <laughs> right. And uh, just both kind of ju jumping up and down and excited as those last turns unfolded. Yeah, we sell you the whole seat, but you only need the edge. <laughs> That's what we say, and that was extraordinary stuff. Now, a reminder, we are waiting to find out, get official confirmation on who is your fourth member of the top four. It is Marcio Carvalho, it is Brian Brown doing, and it is Oliver Two. It's then theoretically one of three, Louis Scott Vargas, Shoji Yasuoka, Lucas Blahon. In reality, and it's one of two. It's Blahon or Yasuoka. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, if it is Shota Yasuoka, and he is in the box seat coming in, had 3% higher than Lucas Blahon on tie breaks, what an achievement and how great to see the Japanese master back in the top four of a world championship after his incredible performance at the Players' Championship a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, I totally agree. Shota, known as one of the greatest deck builders of all time, you know, one of the, the star Japanese players that I've watched for years and years on the Pro Tour, would be great to see him there. That said, you know, Lucas Blahan has also had a fantastic season. He's on a heater. I'd love to see him in the top four as well. So I, I loved hearing what BDM was saying in his interview with Shota about modern, because that's really where Shota cemented his reputation as a deck. But it's part of the reason he's in the Hall of Fame as well, because mm -hmm. he, he has this in incredible reputation, as you say, for deck building. That's where it was cemented. And Shota was almost a little embarrassed. In the interview, he said, Look, I'm really sorry, modern's a bit different now. I can't really do crazy, but I am going to do good. <laughs> and we talked about that coming in, and here he is, potentially, in the top four as a result of a modern deck that wasn't crazy, but was good. From your point of view, inside R&D, just changing gears a little bit, modern is a format I know you cannot possibly expect to test as much as standard and, of course, each new limited format. What's your sense of where modern is? Because the three Grand Prix we had last weekend, the 24 decks that came out of there, hugely different metagame than the 24 decks we've seen here. What's, what's your read on where we are with modern at the moment? Uh, honestly, I think modern is in a great spot. I mean, looking at the Grand Prix over the last few weekends, um, uh, there's just been a tremendous, tremendous diversity of decks. The decks look very different from each other. They play very different. I enjoy watching them on coverage a lot because it's so easy to tell the narrative of the game when the decks just look so different and have a very coherent game plan. And I think if you're a player who enjoys modern, there's a lot out there to choose from and you can kind of choose the deck that best suits your play style. I like that a lot. People were talking at uh, analyzing this metagame here and saying that players uh, at this level moved away from the uh, super aggressive, your Death Shadow Aggro, your Naya Burn, for example. And that part of the reason for that is that if you know it's coming, it's relatively easy to pinpoint the weaknesses and do something about it. 
but maybe therefore at your next modern tournament, maybe you're ideally situated to come out with, let's, let's get those death shadows sleeved up again. Yeah, moderns, it's interesting in that the format has had the reputation that you want to play like a very aggressive deck, a deck that wins very quickly, or it's not interacting with your opponent. We saw the most popular deck here this weekend was actually Obzon, which is a very interactive deck that's trying to kind of grind out the games and trade one for one with the opponents a lot. So, you know, th there is definitely a broad range of things you can choose from in modern, and uh, it's up to you, you know, what your weapon of choice <laughs> might be. And, and when you say, most popular, we mean a third of the field. That's right. Eight of the 24 chose to play that interactive up middle of the range deck. Now, again, at this level, we can see why a lot of people would want to do that, give yourself as many options as possible. But certainly, if you're sleeving up for an RPTQ sometime, PPTQ, or just your Friday Night Magics, and a lot of you play modern for that, there's a lot to be said for just getting those creatures into the battlefield <laughs> early and playing lots of unfair death shadow. Love that deck. All right, so that's the state of modern. If you're just joining us, where have you been, you naughty people? We are just closing in on our top four announcement here at the World Championship and so much to bring you over the next few hours. So don't go away, even though this is the end of our World Championship coverage, a ton of Kaladesh action over the next still four and a bit hours here on Saturday at PAX. I'm assuming that you, like me, have not had the chance to get outside the Paramount and check out the street fair yet. That's right. I actually looked over it from the balconies <laughs> outside here at the theater, and it was looking pretty cool, but I haven't had a chance to experience it for myself. You also allowed yourself 15 seconds That's on the right. way from the booth to the desk. <laughs> right. If, if you are here in Seattle, we must recommend you get yourself down here, come to the street fair, come and join us right here in the Paramount, because there's lots of interactive panels as well. We've got PAX Invents, the card, a little later on. Ian will be here with me chatting about making magic cards as well. Tons of great stuff coming away. An improv show, 7 o'clock tonight as well. But let's look a little bit further down the field, Ian, because the results are now all in and we're looking and seeing how people have done. I want to highlight a couple of people who started off pretty horribly, but in some ways are even more worthy of admiration for the way they fought back. I look at Joel Larson. He was 1 and 5 won his draft yesterday and has ended up at seven and seven. You think, okay, that's like two and two at my FNM, that's not much. But if you're one and five, and then you go beat a Hall of Famer, beat a Pro Tour champion, beat one of the great players from a region of the world, that seven and seven from one and five is a great performance. It absolutely is, yeah. And you got to hand to these players for sticking it out and just doing their best in this tournament. Of course, as we mentioned, every single win you get is worth a pro point, so it's absolutely worth it to keep on fighting. Now. Let's just imagine we're not on air for a moment. I just want to know something about your brother. Is he someone who really enjoys turning the knife on a friend? How do you mean? Well, just, a, just, just an example. Let's suppose that you're friends with Owen Turtenwald and you've tested together and you, you, you love each other dearly as brothers and friends and teammates and you play each other on day one and you beat him. And then you play each other on day two and you beat him and then you play each other on day three and you beat him. Is that something that Owen might hear about a little bit over the coming, I don't know, decade? You know, I don't think so. I don't, in, I don't think he enjoys, uh, Reed enjoys turning the knife, as you said. <laughs> okay. uh, otherwise, I'd be in for some trouble. Okay. I, I think that uh, Reed and Owen both understand that even though they are teammates outside of this tournament, when you come to play in a Magic tournament like this, you're playing to win, right. and it's all professional, mm -hmm. and sometimes you get paired against your friend and your teammate, and you just play a, you know, a fair, natural game of Magic, and whoever wins, wins. Yep. I think Reed will be quite pleased with joining you and me. Um, but yeah, that, that was just one of the rivalries that we've seen. Another one, of course, was uh, Steve Rubin and Oliver too. And look, here we were when we saw that, when, and you were in the commentary box, right, for the Oliver two steve Rubin That's right. standard match on Thursday night. At that point, we, we even then we began trailing the idea that maybe that draw was going to be relevant in the top, in top four mix. Not necessarily, as it turned out, that Oliver Two got there by that single bonus point. Rather than losing in the last turn or two, clung on in there with all, all that interaction of, uh, you know, sort of, is this gonna tap everything down or can I make this? Yeah, it was actually, I mean, one of the most fantastic matches I've seen, certainly all this weekend, and I mean, maybe ever, actually, so. I think, I think actually, it's easy to say that the standard of Magic has been high. Well, of course it has. We've got great Magic players, but the actual games have been truly excellent. The number of three game sets we've had where the swings have been uh, huge, even looking at Luis in that last round. 
where he's sitting there for four turns on one life against Steve Rubin. There have been some really tremendous matches. So if you haven't been with us all weekend long, even if you know what's coming in terms of the top four, there are so many great matches uh, to go back and watch. Yeah, I totally agree. Regardless of what your favorite format is, whether it's standard, limited, or modern here this weekend, there were just awesome matches all across the board in all three formats. Really enjoyed it. So we are still crunching the numbers backstage to find out who is in the final floor. We've got Lucas Blahon out just beyond us in the auditorium um, with his partner in crime and they are waiting anxiously to find out will it be fourth, will it be fifth. Uh, that's what's happening there. Down on the stage, they're gearing up for the top four announcement. Tension aplenty there. I wonder if they know that Lucas is out there right now because he might be needed downstairs for a top four announcement. We'll see what happens uh, with that. Um, but the rest of the results, let's fill you in. BBD 10, 3 and 1. Marcio Carvalho 9, 4, 1. Oliver 2, 9, 4, 1. Then we have our 3, 9, 5. So that's Blahon, Yasuoka and LSV. Who else has a positive record? Well, Ian, we've, we've barely mentioned him today. But Seth Manfield, the reigning world champion, he put up a stern defense of his title, only losing in that last round to Shota to actually definitively end his defense of the crown. That's right, yeah. He, I think he had a little bit of a rocky start actually on day one, but then just surged back in there. He was well in contention all throughout the weekend. And yeah, we, we came very close to seeing him get the opportunity to repeat the world championship. Unfortunately for him, things didn't work out in that last round. Uh, so other players on eight and six with a winning record, which is a great achievement here at the World Championship. You've got JC Tao, the Oath of the Gate Watch uh, champion, and uh, in his great uh, strength here, he, he actually was someone who reflected his own perception of himself. He said, look, really, I feel like a limited specialist. He's six and old limited. Yeah, I mean, fantastic job by him. He played really well. We actually saw him defeat Marcio Carvalho, uh, knocking him out of the, right. the potential, uh, what, three-time undefeated <laughs> yeah. uh, record that he almost had there. Um, yeah, fantastic play by JC all so far this weekend. So well done to JC Tao, eight and six, also eight and six, Tiago Saparito. And he is your leading player from Latin America by one round. Paolo Vita Dama de Rosa is one of the seven and sevens. So who else was on seven and seven? Well, you had Mike Sigrist. I think he'll be disappointed with that. Seven and seven sounds fine but he opened up 5-0. and That's right, yeah. He started off 5-0, and off to a great start. The wheels kind of fell off for a little bit there. You know, got a couple more wins throughout the tournament, but um, I imagine he's probably not happy with the way things rounded out. Yeah, I, I guess the thing is also, I mean, Pro Tours now are multiple format, and they have been for a, a bunch of years, but this triple format, it naturally lends itself to bringing the field together because if you do have a great draft deck, well, that afternoon you have to have a standard deck with good pairings. And if that goes well, you've still got to have a modern deck that goes well with good pairings. And that's very hard to sort of get all three disciplines lined up. Yeah, absolutely true. And you have to make so many calls, you know, whether you're sitting down at the draft and choosing what colors to go into and trying to play around your table, whether you're trying to predict the standard metagame or predict the modern metagame, there's just plenty of chances for things to, to work out, not the way that you expected. All right, well, thanks to Ian G. The results are in, the results are known. It's time for the top four announcement of the World Championship 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the feature match area here at the Paramount Theater. It is time for the World Championship top four announcement. In first place, with 31 match points from the United States, Brian Brown Dewin. And in second place, with 28 match points, from Portugal, Marcio Carvalho. Marcio, congratulations. Marcio, you're going to be right over here on that part. And in third place, 
with 28 match points from the United States, Oliver Two. In fourth place, with 27 match points, from Japan, Shota Yasuoka. Ladies and gentlemen, your top four for the World Championships 2016.